This reading of Heaven, A World of Love by Jonathan Edwards is from the Free Grace Broadcaster magazine, issue 181, and is produced by Stillwater's Revival Books. Part 2 The other fruit of love, as exercised in such circumstances, is to perfect tranquility and joy in heaven. Holy and humble Christian love is a principle of wonderful power to give ineffable quietness and tranquility to the soul. It banishes all disturbance and sweetly composes and brings rest to the spirit and makes all divinely calm and sweet and happy. In that soul where divine love reigns and is in lively exercise, nothing can cause a storm or even gather threatening clouds. There are many principles contrary to love that make this world like a tempestuous sea. Selfishness and envy and revenge and jealousy and kindred passions Keep life on earth in a constant tumult, and make it a scene of confusion and uproar, where no quiet rest is to be enjoyed except in renouncing this world and looking to another. But oh, what rest is there in that world which the God of peace and love fills with his own gracious presence, and in which the Lamb of God lives and reigns, filling it with the brightest and sweetest beams of his love. Where there is nothing to disturb or offend, and no being or object to be seen, that is not surrounded with perfect amiableness and sweetness. Where the saints shall find and enjoy all that they love, and so be perfectly satisfied, where there is no enemy and no enmity, but perfect love in every heart and to every being. Where there is perfect harmony among all the inhabitants, no one envying another, but every one rejoicing in the happiness of every other. Where all their love is humble and holy, and perfectly Christian, without the least carnality or impurity, where love is always mutual and reciprocated to the full, where there is no hypocrisy or dissembling, but perfect simplicity and sincerity, where there is no treachery or unfaithfulness or inconstancy or jealousy in any form, where there is no clog or hindrance to the exercises or expressions of love, no imprudence or indecency in expressing it, and no influence of folly or discretion in any word or deed. Where there is no separation wall and no misunderstanding or strangeness, but full acquaintance and perfect intimacy in all. Where there is no division through different opinions or interest, but where all in that glorious and loving society shall be most nearly and divinely related, and each shall belong to every other. And all shall enjoy each other in perfect prosperity, and riches, and honour, without any sickness or grief or persecution or sorrow, or any enemy to molest them, or any busybody to create jealousy or misunderstanding, or mar the perfect and holy and blessed peace that reigns in heaven. And all this in the garden of God, in the paradise of love, where everything is filled with love. And everything conspires to promote and kindle it, and keep up its flame, and nothing ever interrupts it, but everything has been fitted by an all-wise God 
for its full enjoyment under the greatest advantages for ever. And all, too, where the beauty of the beloved objects shall never fade, and love shall never grow weary nor decay, but the soul shall more and more rejoice in love for ever. Oh, what tranquillity will there be in such a world as this? And who can express the fullness and blessedness of this peace? What a calm is this! How sweet and holy and joyous! What a haven of rest to enter, after having passed through the storms and tempests of this world, in which pride and selfishness and envy and malice and scorn and contempt and contention and vice are as waves of a restless ocean, always rolling and often dashed about in violence and fury. What a Canaan of rest to come to, after going through this waste and howling wilderness, full of snares and pitfalls and poisonous serpents, where no rest could be found. And oh, what joy will there be, springing up in the hearts of the saints, after they have passed through their wearisome pilgrimage, to be brought to such a paradise as this. Here is joy unspeakable indeed, and full of glory, joy that is humble, holy, enrapturing, and divine in its perfection. Love is always a sweet principle, and especially divine love. This, even on earth, is a spring of sweetness, but in heaven it shall become a stream, a river, an ocean. All shall stand about the God of glory, who is the fountain of love, opening, as it were, their very souls to be filled with those effusions of love that are poured forth from his fullness, just as the flowers of the earth in the bright and joyous days of spring, open their bosoms to the sun to be filled with his light and warmth and to flourish in beauty and fragrancy under his cheering rays. In the application of this subject, I remark, 1. If heaven be such a world as has been described, then we may see a reason why contention and strife tend to darken our evidence of fitness for its possession. Experience teaches that this is the effect of contention. When principles of malignity and ill will prevail among God's people, as they sometimes do through the remaining corruption of their hearts, and they get into a contentious spirit, or are engaged in any strife, whether public or private, and their spirits are filled with opposition to their neighbours in any matter whatever, their former evidence for heaven seem to become dim or die away, and they are in darkness about their spiritual state, and do not find that comfortable and satisfying hope that they used to enjoy. And so, when converted persons get into ill frames in their families, the consequence commonly, if not universally, is that they live without much of a comfortable sense of heavenly things or any lively hope of heaven. They do not enjoy much of that spiritual calm and sweetness that those do who live in love and peace. They have not that help from God, and that communion with Him, and that near intercourse with heaven in prayer that others have. The Apostle seems to speak of contention in families as having this influence. His language is, 1 Peter 3, 7, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, brackets your wives, according to knowledge, giving honour unto the wife 
as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Here he intimates that discord in families tends to hinder Christians in their prayers. And what Christian that has made the sad experiment has not done it to his sorrow, and in his own experience does not bear witness to the truth of the Apostle's intimation? Why it is so that contention has this effect of hindering spiritual exercises and comforts and hopes, and of destroying the sweet hope of that which is heavenly, we may learn from the doctrine we have considered. For heaven being a world of love, it follows that when we have the least exercise of love, and the most of a contrary spirit, then we have the least of heaven, and are farthest from it in the frame of our mind. Then we have the least of the exercise of that wherein consists a conformity to heaven, and a preparation for it, and what tends to it. And so, necessarily, we must have least evidence of our title to heaven, and be furthest from the comfort which such evidence affords. We may see again from this subject, too, how happy those are who are entitled to heaven. There are some persons living on earth to whom the happiness of the heavenly world belongs as much, yea, much more than any man's earthly estate belongs to himself. They have a part and interest in this world of love, and have a proper right and title to it. For they are of the number of those of whom it is written, Revelation 22.14, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in to the gates into the city. And, doubtless, there are such persons here amongst us. And, oh, how happy are all such, entitled as they are to an interest in such a world as heaven. Surely they are the blessed of the earth, and the fullness of their blessedness no language can describe, no words express. But here some may be ready to say, Without doubt, they are happy persons that have a title to such a blessed world, and are soon to enter on the eternal possession of its joys. But who are these persons? How shall they be known? And by what marks may they be distinguished? In answer to such an inquiry, I would mention three things that belong to their character. First, they are those that have had the principle or seed of the same love that reigns in heaven implanted in their hearts in this world in the work of regeneration. They are not those who have no other principles in their hearts than natural principles, or such as they have by their first birth, for that which is born of the flesh is flesh. But they are those who have been the subjects of the new birth, or who have been born of the Spirit. A glorious work of the Spirit of God has been wrought in their hearts, renewing them by bringing down from heaven, as it were, some of the light and some of the holy pure flame that is in that world of love and giving it place in them. Their hearts are a soil in which this heavenly seed has been sown, and in which it abides and grows. And so they are changed, and from being earthly have become heavenly in their dispositions. The love of the world is mortified, and the love of God implanted. 
their hearts are drawn to God and Christ, and for their sakes flow out to the saints in humble and spiritual love. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, 1 Peter 1.23, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John 1.13 Second, they are those who have freely chosen the happiness that flows from the exercise and enjoyment of such love as is in heaven, above all other conceivable happiness. They see and understand so much of this as to know that it is the best good. They do not merely yield that it is so from rational arguments that may be offered for it, and by which they are convinced that it is so, but they know it is so from what little they have tasted of it. It is the happiness of love, and the beginning of a life of such love, holy, humble, divine, and heavenly love. Love to God and love to Christ, and love to saints for God and Christ's sake, and the enjoyment of the fruits of God's love in holy communion with God. And Christ and with holy persons, this is what they have a relish for, and such is their renewed nature, that such happiness suits their disposition and appetite and wishes above all other things. And not only above all things that they have, but above all that they can conceive it possible that they could have. The world does not afford anything like it. They have chosen this before all things else, and chosen it freely. Their souls go out after it more than after everything else, and their hearts are more eager in pursuit of it. They have chosen it not merely because they have met with sorrow, and are in such low and afflicted circumstances that they do not expect much from the world, but because their hearts were so captivated by this good, that they chose it for its own sake before all worldly good, even if they could have ever so much of the latter, and enjoy it ever so long. Third, they are those who, from the love that is in them, are, in heart and life, in principle and practice, struggling after holiness. Holy love makes them long for holiness. It is a principle that thirsts after growth. It is in imperfection and in a state of infancy in this world, and it desires growth. It has much to struggle with. In the heart in this world, there are many opposite principles and influences and it struggles after greater oneness, and more liberty, and more free exercise, and better fruit. The great strife and struggle of the new man is after holiness. His heart struggles after it, for he has an interest in heaven, and therefore he struggles with that sin that would keep him from it. He is full of ardent desires, and breedings, and longings, and strivings to be holy. And his hands struggle as well as his heart. He strives in his practice. His life is a life of sincere and earnest endeavour to be universally and increasingly holy. He feels that he is not holy enough but far from it, and he desires to be nearer perfection, and more like those who are in heaven. And this is one reason why he longs to be in heaven, that he may be perfectly holy, 
and the great principle which leads him thus to struggle is love. It is not only fear, but it is love to God and love to Christ and love to holiness. Love is a holy fire within him, and like any other flame which is in a degree pent up, it will and does struggle for liberty, and this its struggling is the struggle for holiness. 3. What has been said on this subject may well awaken and alarm the impenitent, and, first, by putting them in mind of their misery, in that they have no portion or right in this world of love. You have heard what has been said of heaven. What kind of glory and blessedness is there, and how happy the saints and angels are in that world of perfect love. But consider that none of this belongs to you. When you hear of such things, you hear of that in which you have no interest. No such person as you, a wicked hater of God and Christ, and one that is under the power of a spirit of enmity against all that is good, shall ever enter there. Such as you are, never belong to the faithful Israel of God, and shall never enter their heavenly rest. It may be said to you, as Peter said to Simon, Acts 8.21, Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. And as Nehemiah said to Sanballat and his associates, Nehemiah 2.20, You have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. If such a soul as yours should be admitted into heaven, that world of love, how nauseous would it be to those blessed spirits whose souls are as a flame of love, and how would it discompose that loving and blessed society and put everything in confusion? It would make heaven no longer heaven if such souls should be admitted there. It would change it from a world of love to a world of hatred, and pride, and envy, and malice, and revenge, as this world is. But this shall never be, and the only alternative is, that such as you shall be shut out with dogs, and sorcerers, and whoremongers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever love it, and make it a lie. Revelation 22.15 that is, with all that is vile, and unclean, and unholy. And this subject may well awaken and alarm the impenitent, secondly, by showing them that they are in danger of hell, which is a world of hatred. There are three worlds. One is this, which is an intermediate world, a world in which good and evil are so mixed together as to be a sure sign that this world is not to continue forever. Another is heaven, a world of love without any hatred. And the other is hell, a world of hatred where there is no love, which is the world to which all of you who are in a Christless state properly belong. This last is the world where God manifests his displeasure and wrought, as in heaven he manifests his love. Everything in hell is hateful. There is not one solitary object there that is not odious and detestable, horrid and hateful. There is no person or thing to be seen there that is amiable or lovely. Nothing that is pure, or holy, or pleasant, but everything abominable and odious. 
There are no beings there but devils, and damned spirits that are like devils. Hell is, as it were, a vast den of poisonous hissing serpents. The old serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and with him all his hateful brood. In that dark world there are none but those whom God hates with a perfect and everlasting hatred. He exercises no love and extends no mercy to any one object there, but pours out upon them horrors without mixture. All things in the wide universe that are hateful shall be gathered together in hell, as in a vast receptacle provided on purpose, that the universe which God has made may be cleansed of its filthiness by casting it all into this great sink of wickedness and woe. It is a world prepared on purpose for the expression of God's rod. He has made hell for this, and he has no other use for it but dare to testify forever his hatred of sin and sinners, where there is no token of love or mercy. There is nothing there but what shows forth the divine indignation and wrath. Every object shows forth wrath. It is a world all overflowed with a deluge of wrath, as it were, with a deluge of liquid fire, so as to be called a lake of fire and brimstone, and the second debt. There are none in hell but what have been haters of God, and so have procured his wrath and hatred on themselves, and there they shall continue to hate him for ever. No love to God will ever be felt in hell, but everyone there perfectly hates him, and so will continue to hate him, and without any restraint will express their hatred to him, blaspheming and raging against him, while they gnaw their tongues for pain. And though they all join together in their enmity and opposition to God, yet there is no union or friendliness among themselves. They agree in nothing but hatred and the expression of hatred. They hate God and Christ and angels and saints in heaven. And not only so, but they hate one another like a company of serpents or vipers, not only spitting out venom against God, but at one another, biting and stinging and tormenting each other. The devils in hell will hate damned souls. They hated them while in this world, and therefore it was with such subtlety and unceasing temptations they sought their ruin. They thirsted for the blood of their souls because they hated them. They longed to get them in their power to torment them. They watched them as a roaring lion does his prey. Because they hated them, therefore they flew upon their souls like hellhounds, as soon as ever they were parted from their bodies, full of eagerness to torment them. And now they have them in their power, they will spend eternity in tormenting them with the utmost strength and cruelty that devils are capable of. They are, as it were, continually and eternally tearing these poor damned souls that are in their hands. And these latter will not only be hated and tormented by devils, but they will have no love or pity one towards another, but will be like devils one to another, and will, to their utmost, torment each other, being like brands in the fire, each of which helps to burn the others. 
In hell, all those principles will reign and rage that are contrary to love, without any restraining grace to keep them within bounds. Here will be unrestrained pride and malice and envy and revenge and contention in all its fury and without end, never knowing peace. The miserable inhabitants will bite and devour one another, as well as be enemies to God and Christ and holy beings. Those who, in their wickedness on earth, were companions together, and had a sort of carnal friendship one for another, will here have no appearance of fellowship, but perfect and continual and undisguised hatred will exist between them. As on earth they promoted each other's sins, so now in hell they will promote each other's punishment. On earth they were the instruments of undoing each other's souls. There they were occupied in blowing up the fires of each other's lusts, and now they will blow forever the fires of each other's torments. They ruined one another in sinning, setting bad examples to each other, poisoning each other by wicked talk, and now they will be as much engaged in tormenting as once they were in tempting and corrupting each other. And there their hatred and envy, and all evil passions, will be a torment to themselves. God and Christ, whom they will hate most, and towards whom their souls will be as full of hatred as an oven is ever full of fire, will be infinitely above their reach, dwelling in infinite blessedness and glory, which they cannot diminish. And they will but torment themselves by their fruitless envy of the saints and angels in heaven, whom they cannot come nigh to or harm. And they shall have no pity from them or from anyone, for hell is looked on only with hatred, and with no pity or compassion and thus they will be left to spend their eternity together. Now consider all ye that are out of Christ, and that were never born again, and that never had any blessed renovation of your hearts by the Holy Spirit, implanting divine love in them, and leading you to choose the happiness that consists in holy love as your best and sweetest good, and to spend your life in struggling after holiness. Consider your danger and what is before you. For this is the world to which ye are condemned, and so the world to which you belong through the sentence of the law. And the world that every day and hour you are in danger of having your abode everlastingly fixed in, and the world to which, if you repent not, you will soon go, instead of going to that blessed world of love of which you have now heard. Consider, oh, consider, that it is indeed thus with you. These things are not cunningly devised fables, but the great and dreadful realities of God's word, and things that, in a little while, you will know with everlasting certainty are true. How, then, can you rest in such a state as you are in, and go about so carelessly from day to day, and so heedless and neglectful of your precious immortal souls? Consider seriously these things, and be wise for yourself, before it is too late, before your feet stumble on the dark mountains, and you fall into the world of wrath and hatred, where there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, 
with spiteful malice and rage against God and Christ and one another, and with horror and anguish of spirit forever. Flee to the stronghold while ye are prisoners of hope, before the door of hope is closed, and the agonies of the second debt shall begin their work, and your eternal doom is sealed. 4. Let the consideration of what has been said of heaven stir up all earnestly to seek after it. If heaven be such a blessed world, then let it be our chosen country, and the inheritance that we look for and seek. Let us turn our course this way, and press on to its possession. It is not impossible, but that this glorious world may be obtained by us. It is offered to us. Though it be so excellent and blessed a country, yet God stands ready to give us an inheritance there, if it be but the country that we desire, and will choose and diligently seek. God gives us our choice. We may have our inheritance wherever we choose it, and may obtain heaven if we will but seek it by patient continuance in well-doing. We are all of us, as it were, set here in this world as in a vast wilderness, with diverse countries about it, and with several ways or paths leading to these different countries, and we are left to our choice what course we will take. If we heartily choose heaven, and set our hearts entirely on that blessed Canaan, that land of love, and if we choose and love the path that leads to it, we may walk in that path, and if we continue to walk in it, it will lead us to heaven at last. Let what we have heard of the land of love stir us all up to turn our faces toward it, and bend our course thitherward. Is not what we have heard of the happy state of that country, and the many delights that are in it, enough to make us thirst after it, and to cause us, with the greatest earnestness and steadfastness of resolution, to press towards it, and spend our whole lives in travelling in the way that leads thither? What joyful news might it well be to us, when we hear of such a world of perfect peace and holy love, and to hear that it is possible, yea, that there is full opportunity for us to come to it and spend an eternity in its joys. Truly this is an evil world, and so it is like to be. It is in vain for us to expect that it will be any other than a world of sin, a world of pride and enmity and strife, and so a restless world. And though the times may hereafter be mended, yet these things will always be more or less found in the world so long as it stands. Who then would content himself with a portion in such a world? What man, acting wisely and considerately, would concern himself much about laying up in store in such a world as this, and would not rather neglect the world, and let it go to them that would take it, and apply all his heart and strength to lay up treasure in heaven, and to press on to that world of love. What will it signify for us to hoard up great possessions in this world? And how can the thought of having our portion here be pleasing to us, when there is an interest offered us in such a glorious world as heaven is, 
and especially when, if we have our portion here, we must, when the world has passed away, have our eternal portion in hell, that world of hatred and of endless wrath of God, where only devils and damned spirits dwell. We all naturally desire rest and quietness, and if we would obtain it, let us seek that world of peace and love of which we have now heard, where a sweet and blessed rest remain it for God's people. If we get an interest in that world, then, when we have done this, we shall leave all our cares and troubles and fatigues and perplexities and disturbances forever. We shall rest from these storms that are raging here and from every toil and labour in the paradise of God. You that are poor and think yourself despised by your neighbours and little cared for among men, do not much concern yourselves for this. Do not care much for the friendship of the world, but seek heaven where there is no such a thing as contempt and where none are despised, but all are highly esteemed and honoured, and dearly beloved by all. You that think you have met with many abuses and much ill-treatment from others, care not for it. Do not hate them for it, but set your heart on heaven, that world of love, and press toward that better country, where all is kindness and holy affection. And hear for direction how to seek heaven. First, let not your heart go after the things of this world as your chief good. Indulge not yourself in the possession of earthly things as though they were to satisfy your soul. This is the reverse of seeking heaven. It is to go in a way contrary to that which leads to the world of love. If you would seek heaven, your affections must be taken off from the pleasures of the world. You must not allow yourself in sensuality, or worldliness, or the pursuit of the enjoyments or honours of the world or occupy your thoughts or time in heaping up the dust of the earth. You must mortify the desires of vain glory and become poor in spirit and lowly in heart. Second, you must, in your meditations and holy exercises, be much engaged in conversing with heavenly persons and objects and enjoyments. You cannot constantly be seeking heaven without having your thoughts much there. Turn then the stream of your thoughts and affections towards that world of love, and towards the God of love that dwells there, and toward the saints and angels that are at Christ's right hand. Let your thoughts also be much on the objects and enjoyments of the world of love. Commune much with God and Christ in prayer, and think often of all that is in heaven, of the friends who are there, and the praises and worship there, and of all that will make up the blessedness of that world of love. Let your conversation be in heaven. Third, be content to pass through all difficulties in the way to heaven. Though the path is before you, and you may walk in it if you desire, yet it is a way that is ascending, and filled with many difficulties and obstacles. That glorious city of light and love is, as it were, on the top of a hill or mountain, 
and there is no way to it but by upward and arduous steps. But though the ascent be difficult, and the way full of trials, still it is worth your while to meet them all for the sake of coming and dwelling in such a glorious city at last. Be willing then to undergo the labour, and meet the toil, and overcome the difficulty. What is it all in comparison with the sweet rest that is at your journey's end? Be willing to cross the natural inclination of flesh and blood, which is downward, and press onward and upward to the prize. At every step it will be easier and easier to ascend, and the higher your ascent, the more will you be cheered by the glorious prospect before you, and by a nearer view of that heavenly city where, in a little while, you shall forever be at rest. Fort, in all your way, let your eye be fixed on Jesus, who has gone to heaven as your forerunner. Look to him. Behold his glory in heaven, that a sight of it may stir you up the more earnestly to desire to be there. Look to him in his example. Consider how, by patient continuance in well-doing, and by patient endurance of great suffering, he went before you to heaven. Look to him as your mediator, and trust in the atonement which he has made, entering into the holies of all in the upper temple. Look to him as your intercessor, who forever pleads for you before the throne of God. Look to him as your strength, that by his Spirit he may enable you to press on and overcome every difficulty of the way. Trust in his promises of heaven to those that love and follow him, which he has confirmed by entering into heaven as the head and representative and saviour of his people. And, fifth, if you would be in the way to the world of love, see that you live a life of love, of love to God and love to men all of us hope to have a part in the world of love hereafter, and therefore we should cherish the spirit of love and live a life of holy love here on earth. This is the way to be like the inhabitants of heaven, who are now confirmed in love forever. Only in this way can you be like them in excellence and loveliness and like them too in happiness and rest and joy. By living in love in this world you may be like them too, in sweet and holy peace, and thus have on earth the foretaste of heavenly pleasures and delights. Thus also you may have a sense of the glory of heavenly things as of God and Christ and holiness. And your heart be disposed and opened by holy love to God, and by the spirit of peace and love to men, to a sense of the excellence and sweetness of all that is to be found in heaven. Thus shall the windows of heaven be, as it were, opened, so that its glorious light shall shine in upon your soul. Thus you may have the evidence of your fitness for that blessed world, and that you are actually on the way to its possession. And being thus made meet, through grace, for the inheritance of the saints in light, when a few more days shall have passed away, you shall be with them in their blessedness for ever. Happy, thrice happy those who shall thus be found faithful to the end, 
and then shall be welcomed to the joy of the Lord. There they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and lead them to living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Stillwater's Revival Books is now located at PuritanDownloads.com. It's your worldwide online Reformation home for the very best in free and discounted classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, MP3s, and videos. For much more information on the Puritans and Reformers, including the best free and discounted classic and contemporary books, MP3s, digital downloads, and videos, please visit Stillwater's Revival Books at PuritanDownloads.com. Stillwater's Revival Books also publishes the Puritan Hard Drive, the most powerful and practical Christian study tool ever produced. All thanks and glory be to the mercy, grace, and love of the Lord Jesus Christ for this remarkable and wonderful new Christian study tool. The Puritan Hard Drive contains over 12,500 of the best Reformation books, MP3s, and videos ever gathered onto one portable Christian study tool. An extraordinary collection of Puritan, Protestant, Calvinistic, Presbyterian, Covenanter, and Reformed Baptist resources. It's fully upgradable and it's small enough to fit in your pocket. The Puritan hard drive combines an embedded database containing many millions of records with the most amazing and extraordinary custom Christian search and research software ever created. The Puritan hard drive has been produced to assist you in the fascinating and exhilarating spiritual, intellectual, familial, ecclesiastical, and societal adventure that is living the Christian life. It has been specifically designed so that you might more faithfully know, serve, and love the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as to help you to do all you can to bring glory to His great name. If you want to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, then the Puritan hard drive is for you. Visit PuritanDownloads.com today for much more information on the Puritan hard drive and to take advantage of all the free and discounted Reformation and Puritan books, MP3s, and videos that we offer at Stillwater's Revival Books.